Hello, I'm David Dixon. I'm Father Derek Larson. And I'm Father Doug Scharf. Welcome back to Sunday Ready. Uh, we are preparing uh, this week for the fourth Sunday in Lent, which is March uh, 27th. And the readings for this coming Sunday are from the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 5, 9 through 12, Psalm 32, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21, and continuing in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, 1 through 3, 11b through 32. The parable of the prodigal son we get to unpack this week. Um, but before we do that, we've got a couple readings to get through Joshua, uh, Psalm 32, and 2 Corinthians. Um, so let's kick things off with Joshua chapter 5. I love the story of Joshua, um, especially as a kid, you kind of get all of these really cool battle scenes and things like that. So just, just for some context here, um, Joshua and the Israelites have just crossed the river into the promised land for the first time in 40 years of wandering around the wilderness. And in the next chapter, chapter six, I believe it is, um, they, they, have this miraculous attack on the city of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. If you know the song after having walked around it, but before that battle of Jericho, here they are having just crossed um, into the promised land in this place of Gilgal. They set up this kind of um, sacred place and they celebrate the Passover together. And so what's significant about this passage is that they've been celebrating presumably the Passover for 40 years, because the Passover started when they left Egypt. But most of the time, throughout those 40 years, I just wonder what the celebration of the Passover would have been like, because the whole theme of Passover is that God passed over and freed us from Egypt. But up to this point, freed us from Egypt to what? To wander around in the desert and to not, and so, so they wouldn't have necessarily felt the full impact, the full power of that salvation, because it was somewhat incomplete. And yet here they cross over into the promise and it hasn't become their land fully yet. Uh, but this is the first Passover when they actually get to see the product of what God has been working on for the last 40 years. So it's a powerful passage there. And then this, this image of the manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Um, you know, that could be just a passing thing about what they were eating, but I don't think so. I think the, the symbolism of eating the produce from the land of Canaan, meaning from the promised land, suddenly the promised land becomes their land. The, the land that was promised to them, they finally are are seeing the fruits of that. They, they are seeing the product of God's promise and God's salvation for the first time. I think that's an incredible reading, uh, Derek, and thank you for that. That's helped me to really unpack this in, in a new way. And it makes me think about, you know, when they first left Egypt, they're longing for, you know, the cucumbers and the, <clears throat> and the leeks and the melons of, of, of Egypt, right? Because, you know, they were enslaved, but they weren't starving necessarily, right? And so they move out into the wilderness where they're, they're, the land is not producing. Um, and for us in our kind of um, 21st century American culture, where we just walk down to the store and buy stuff, it's hard for us to imagine how significant um, mm -hmm. it was to eat from your land um, mm -hmm. and for your land to produce. Um, and how important that was for the economy, for their sense of identity, for their sense of security. Um, and so when they left Egypt, um, that sense of security was, was taken away, even though they were now free. <clears throat> the other thing that strikes me is when God provides the manna, we sort of think of it oftentimes as sort of that one-off thing that God did. But here we're reminded that this, was, that this is what sustained them 
through all those years in the wilderness, God's provision, God's faithfulness, God's grace and God's abundance. But now they get to the land. Um, and as you said, Derek, they're, they're eating um, from the land. And what an incredible image you gave us of them finally realizing the full import of the, the promise of Passover. Yeah. Yeah, I think I love the phrase, I've rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, yeah. uh, the disgrace of your past, where you've been. It's interesting because it's at a place called Gilgal. There are certain places throughout the, the course of Israel's life, Beersheba, Gilgal, Bethel, uh, that God meets and God either manifests uh, God's self or there's some real connection with the story, ongoing story and journey of Israel. And here, in, and in the course of that, typically there's like a memorial that's set up at these locations as, a, as an act of remembrance, call, call for a remembrance of what God has done in your life. And, and, and I think that it's very important that, uh, you know, there are a lot of stuff we need to forget that's in our past, but there's a lot of stuff we need to remember. And we need to remember and be able to recall those places where God met with us and God uh, showed God's self to us in a very intimate and very real way. We need to forget all of the pain, all of the stuff that we've experienced and not allow that to dictate where we're going. Because as the text says, we are going into, we're entering into this promised place and we are now going to be eating from that promise. We're going to be partaking of the fullness of that promise. It's a new day. It's a new hour. Uh, and it's going to take a new kind of mindset to uh, enter into this place. We can no longer just hopefully wait until the morning and go gather our manna. Now we're going to have to begin to work in this land. We're going to have to see that this land is going to produce for us the things that God's promised for us. So it's a whole different mindset, I think, uh, with going into entering into this uh, place. And it takes a new leadership, right? Joshua leads them into this place, not Moses. Moses had the vision or the dream of this promised land. Joshua now is commissioned with a vision of leading the people into it to possess the promises of God. So there is a huge transition that's taking place right here with this particular passage. Yeah. All right, Psalm 32. Um, as, as I was reading through Psalm 32, um, I couldn't help but hear uh, echoes from the prodigal son story. Um, as I read mm -hmm. it, happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is put away. Um, your hand was heavy upon me. Then I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. And so I, I see in the Psalm, um, some of the same sort of sequencing and, and progression of events that, um, that, that happen in, in the story of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. Which I think maybe why the lectionary paired it with Right, and, and, <laughs> which is which is cool because we 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 tend to think of Lent as a time to kind of be to not celebrate, mm -hmm. uh, but here we'll get to it in the prodigal son uh, story. But uh, we see a father who celebrates, and and not just any celebration, but throws a huge party. And here. In this psalm, we see that as well. Happy are they. Happy are they, it says. It ends the psalm. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. And so, you know, the occasion of repentance doesn't have to be, you know, it's not some sad thing. It can be a solemn thing. It can be a hard thing, a challenging thing. Uh, but it's actually a celebratory thing. And so in that sense, Lent is really a season of of celebration because we we spend time you know reflecting on themes of repentance and it's the themes of repentance that lead us to easter so i'm reading this in in the context of lent um but we have you know and we have this pattern verse three while i held my tongue my bones withered away 
for your hand was heavy upon me day and night. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and didn't conceal my guilt. So I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. So what I see in that is repentance is an act of letting go. It's letting go of, of all the things that we carry, letting go of our pride that, that prevents us from becoming humble and owning up to the things that we've done wrong and uh, letting go of those things so that we can be, so that we can take up joy and happiness again, so that we can take up the joy of the Lord. I, I like that, Derek, that repentance that doesn't lead to celebration um, maybe isn't repentant, right? Like it, 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 it's not meant to just keep us down, right? It's meant to lead to something. And on the flip side of that, we often think that it's God's anger or judgment that that sort of um, uh, sub, uh, presses us into repentance or submission. But the Bible says it's God's kindness that mm -hmm. leads to repentance, right? So on both sides, it's God, God's kindness that leads to repentance. Repentance leads to joy. Yeah. And I think that that's a really helpful paradigm for the season of Lent. Sorry, David, yeah. I cut you off. No, 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 you're, you're right. The goodness of the Lord leads us to repentance. It's not the fear of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That leads us to repentance. It's the goodness of the Lord. Even though I was brought up in a church that preached the fear of the Lord to get you to repent, it's the goodness of the Lord that brings us to repentance. And I love this passage because it deals with this idea of confession. And of course, confession is something we talk about perhaps maybe in Lent, Advent, and more than any other time of the year for the Episcopal Church. Confession is a regular thing with the our Catholic brothers and sisters, right? Um I like the idea of confessing. There, there is something powerful about me being able to confess my sin to my priest, to my uh, person that is over me in the Lord, and hearing them say to me, your sin is forgiven. There's something freeing and liberating about that. And so we get this idea, and it, it tells you right here, when I held my tongue, my bones withered within me. Whenever I would not allow myself to come to the place of confessing my sin, of being able to rid myself and, and just, as Derek said, let go of this. Sometimes you have to just say it to be able to let go of it. Uh, there's been times in my life where I wrote stuff down and then I just burnt what I wrote to just free myself from that episode or those events in my life or my past just being able to let go of that stuff and having people that you are in covenant relationship with that you can go to and not only be accountable to, but to be able to hear the voice and the grace of God and mercy come through them to you in the midst of your failures and failings and all of that uh, stuff that we experience in life because we all experience it in one degree or another is so powerful and important. So mm -hmm. I just think um, for me, confession is something that certainly is good for the soul. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to 2 Corinthians 5. Um, for me, this particular passage is one of the defining passages for my whole sense of call and vocation and ministry. And I think, you know, all of us who have a sense of, of call to ministry have those particular images or ways of understanding the gospel that energize us and inform how we preach, how we do pastoral care, how we, how we minister um, to people. And that to me, this, for me, this is one of those transformational passages. And I'm sure it is for a lot of people, but um, the image of new creation is one that I've held on to for a long time not only for us as individuals, but for all of creation, right? This image in Revelation 21, behold, I make all things new. And I love N.T. Wright, um, when he talks about this passage, he reminds us that in Greek, um, where it says, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. There's no being verb in Greek. We fill that in with the translation. It simply right. says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. It's like, it's like just an exclamation that Paul yeah. makes. And what N.T. Wright says is, you know, the way he reads this is that each one of us um, is, is a reflection, a piece, a bit 
of that new creation that is to come, but but we are we are a um, uh, a, a foretaste of that. Our lives are meant to be a foretaste of what that new creation is going to be ultimately um, when all things are are made new. And then this call um, to be ambassadors, that God has reconciled the world to himself through Christ. We have been given the message, the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors. God is, is making his appeal through us um, to, to the world. I mean, I can't think of a more um, appropriate way to think about our ministry um, in, in the context of what's going on in our world today um, than, than this image of being ambassadors of reconciliation. What if the church really understood itself as, as being an ambassador of God's re reconciliation? And then the final verse, um, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Um, and what I what I find so powerful about that is it doesn't say God made him to be sinful that we might be righteous. It said God made him sin that we might be righteousness, the righteousness of God. It's, it's just, this is about on this is ontological. Um, you know what I mean? Um, so anyway, I could go on and on, but it's a powerful, powerful passage that I think every follower of Jesus needs to wrestle with and ho grab hold of. Um, especially with what's going on in our world today. So I'll let you all carry on. I love this passage. It's, it's, uh, again, with me, as you were saying, it's one of my uh, guiding passages in ministry. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, what a powerful uh, commission right? And understanding that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not holding against us what could be held against us, and has given us this message, be reconciled. You know, this is, this is reconciliation. God has done the thing. You are reconciled. As far as God is concerned, it's a done deal, right? So now the message is be reconciled, recognize that this is the case because as the last part of this says, Christ became sin who knew no sin so that you and I could become righteous who knew no righteousness. I didn't do anything that was righteous to become righteous. I became righteous by virtue of the work of God in Christ. It's not something I can do to merit it or to gain it or to produce it. Again, it's, it's, it's what God's act is toward us that brings about the act and the work of salvation in our life. And we simply live into the reality of that. We live into the, the blessing of God's grace and ministry of forgiveness and redemption. And if you go through, through scripture and see all of the re words, all of the words that begin with the prefix re, redeem, restore, revive, reconcile, all of those things mean to bring us back <laughs> to that place that we're supposed to be, that God's intention for us is to be. And I think it's a powerful, powerful passage and image when we see that God is doing this work. Uh, and we simply live into the fact that God has done this thing. I think it, it should be central to what we preach because it's central to what Jesus preaches and what God preaches. Um, here in this passage, the word reconciled or reconciliation is mentioned five times in this very short passage. So we in the Episcopal Church have, have taken that seriously. Hopefully we take it even more seriously. But reconciliation is the primary message of, of what the church is supposed to be about. The reconciliation between us and God, between us and one another, between nation and nation, between the world and God, between all of creation. Reconciliation is really the heart. Um, in, sermon, in seminary, I learned from... Um, a priest and historian in New York, uh, the Reverend Dr. Carlin Roland Guzman, and uh, she has a she has a book out. And one of the things she says in this, her book 
um, or, or she tries to get going the, the theme or the, the trend, hashtag BCP855, mm-hmm. hashtag BCP855. And what she means by that is Book of Common Prayer, page 855 in the Catechism, where it says, what is the mission of the church? Mm-hmm. The mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. And so she's trying to start this trend that every Episcopalian should know that line from the from the prayer book because it's central to what it means to being a church, to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. That's that's reconciliation, and that's what this passage is about. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And I, I and uh, thank you for raising that, Derek, because we're going to get into the prodigal son here in a second. We've only ha- got like five minutes left or something, but we'll just keep going. Um, um, you know, because all of these passages to some to some degree or another call us to this this work of, of unity um, and, and community and reconciliation. So just it's just powerful. All right, Luke chapter 15. Uh, It's a long parable. Luke likes to tell long parables. Um, There is way too much to unpack in the next five to seven minutes, but we'll try our best. Um, Everyone has a particular entry point um, into into this passage. Um, For me, um, it really comes down to the name itself. We call this the, the prodigal son, right? The word prodigal, of course, can mean, you know, reckless or um, extravagant, um, uh, and in many ways, it is it is the father, or or if you want to take it one step back from that, you know, God, who is the is the prodigal God, right? Who um, recklessly and lavishly uh, bestows grace um, uh, upon us, and so the, the 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 younger son is prodigal in his in his sin. Um, God is prodigal in in God's grace and and mercy. Uh, yeah, and I'll say you say there's many entry points, and then you mentioned the name. I always find it interesting. Depending on the Bible you're reading, it has a different name, mm-hmm. right? The the na- there is no real name uh, for this passage in the original text, but when Bibles publish it, they often put a name for the story above it. And depending on your entry point, sometimes it's called the prodigal son. Sometimes it's called the lost son. I've seen it called the merciful father. Mm-hmm. I've seen it called the ungrateful brother. And uh, and so what is the point of this, this passage? Like we could lift it up and look at it different ways. You know, what can we learn from the father? What can we learn from the first son? What can we learn from his brother? Um there's so many entry points. I've here. seen it called the parable of two sons. The two sons, right. Yeah. Or two sons and a father. Or yeah. two sons and a father. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I like uh, one. For me, just the opening kind of intro phrase here that the Pharisees and scribes say, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Right. I mean, this is this is what we're about, folks. We have to wel- we're welcoming sinners and we eat with them. This is it. <laughs> this is this goes with that Corinthians passage, reconciliation, right? I mean, come on. This is what the church is about. You know, God forbid a sinner show up in church. You know, I mean, what are we gonna do? That's what it's all about, folks. And I love this um this parable. There's just like you were saying, there's so many things to say about it, but one thing that has always caught my attention about this. And I like other translations uh, make this a bit more clear than this particular one, uh, where the prodigal son arises. He says, he arises and he says, I'll go to my father and I'm going to say to my father, give me the portion that is due me, right? That's his request in the beginning. Give me, give me. But when he gets through eating the husks he's feeding to swine, to the pigs, he comes to himself and he says, perhaps I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, make me one of your servants. Now it's make me in King James and other translations. And this one, it says, treat me as one of your servants. What a stark change 
of requests. Give me, but now make me. So sometimes we go on this journey to just get us in the right frame of mind and right condition and position for God to make us into what we need to be, into what God desires us to be. And our our song changes. We're no longer singing, give me, give me, give me, but we're singing, make me, make me, make me. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think we can close with this. Uh, You might not be surprised um, that this has inspired um, many, many works of art um, paintings and poetry and, um, uh, uh, reflect, you know, stained glass window. I mean, just, just so many various, um, ways in which this has been, um, expressed. And, uh, one of the most famous is by Rembrandt and, um, that particular painting when Henry Nouwen, many of you know, Henry Nouwen, when he saw that painting, it was a transformational experience for him because he saw himself, uh, embraced by the father. And his whole theology of being God's beloved really came out in part from that experience of seeing Rembrandt's painting and seeing the embrace of the father. And um, there it is. Thank you, Father Derek. Um, <laughs> thank you. And so we'll just, we'll, just, we'll just end with that, right? That there's so much to unpack, but at the center of this parable for many of us is that embrace um, that the father runs to meet mm-hmm. his son mm-hmm. and, and, and welcomes him home. Amen. And, uh, and that is God's promise. So, well, thank you all. Um, and father Derek, we are um, praying for, for you. And um, when you get back from leave, we will welcome you back. And, uh, and uh, we're praying for you and your family. Thank Amen. You. All right. Have a great week, everybody. Bye. Bye.